the good thing about a startup, you can be nimble, you can be agile, you can pivot, you can find ways to even go on the offense rather on the defense. Um, uh, so it's not time to panic. It's a delay of, of things. So, so it's not the end of humanity. So we're, we're, we're going on. Uh, yes, the, of course, the risk would be a bit on, I would say, of course, I mean, if you're squeezed on cash and you're building something that is not of a necessity at the moment, maybe there is a, a, a reason to believe, to, to think about pivoting, about finding ways to survive till this, this ends. Um, but again, on, on the other side, if I talk a bit about the mature companies and what we've seen after uh, we've looked at the companies and we asked for doomsday scenario and, and different scenarios to foresee the coming budget and, and so on, there is, of course, a bit on, uh, on, two, on two, two areas. First, the where you operate. So Egypt, because also we operate in Egypt and, and in the region. So Egypt is different than UAE and, and, and KSA. And, and uh, I say these two countries because they, they represent an important market for us. So these countries are more on a lockdown than in Egypt. So some of the businesses that we've seen are performing OK in Egypt versus complete uh, decline in, in the other uh, countries. So back to your question, it's not time to panic. There are ways to manage things. One of the things that you need to look at is your current situation, the products that you're offering. Where are you on your product? Did you launch? Are you launching? Do you have the funds? So some startups would have received the funds before Corona and they, are, they were building a, 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 the product or the service. So maybe this is not a bad time to actually build and focus on the product and be ready post Corona. Of course, given uh, the fact that you are uh, um, expecting what would be post corona of course no one knows when it will end but we know it will end sometime so having a plan a b and c and this is what we've done is one of the recommendations that i would give to start up as well perfect thank you Fadi. so um th this is more on the uh, you you have shed light some on on the mena situation and that uh, actually egypt is is performing in terms of market performance is performing a lot better than other countries who are on complete lockdown that may be leading to more um, more issues or more problematic situations. Uh, I know Karim has been uh, doing a lot of travels before the uh, airport lockdowns uh, around around the uh, around the world, and uh, so you've got the chance to see uh, firsthand the differences and the pivots that have been happening and the disruptions that have been happening globally. So, from your perspective, uh, from the international side where are the startups and what's happening in, in this space, what's happening post-COVID-19 and what's happening towards the recession? Yeah, it's a, a great question. So I think uh, a lot of similar things to, to what Teddy was, was saying. Um, companies are really taking a moment to kind of pause, um, take a step back and kind of assess and see what opportunities there are. You know, there's a lot of things that are uh, that are driving change right now. For example, um, in the U.S., from a regulatory perspective, um, something that was unregulated, such as uh, telehealth, right, or digital health, now is becoming very commonplace as a byproduct, right, of of, of COVID and the the circumstances that it creates. And traditionally, usually regulation comes in after there's validation from a consumer market, right, and then the regulation kind of comes in to kind of build around a way. For it to work. So you're seeing a lot of opportunities for that in, in different markets for these things to kind of develop, the things that were um, not really codified prior. Um, you're seeing uh, uh, from a regulatory perspective. Um, from the specific company perspective, again, you're seeing a lot of, uh, you're seeing a lot of innovation. You're seeing companies that are identifying that maybe my product or service is not a must have, it's a like to have or a nice to have. And then they essentially, some of them are looking back and saying, what is you know, if, if we have specific personas that we were primarily focused on that were creating the highest growth, uh, maybe what we do, they might be very price sensitive and they may be affected by this. So we maybe focus on a different type of persona with the same product. Maybe what they do is they actually begin iterating on their product or pivoting their product for a completely, a completely different use case. And that's something, for example, that we have in, in our portfolio, we have a, a company that was 
just about to launch and it was an augmented reality um, application that allows you to discover uh, tours around you, right? And I don't think anybody's traveling or, or, or exploring tours at the moment. So, okay, how can we take that utility um, and apply it to something else? Right now we're looking at maybe some sort of like augmented reality social connection or being able to identify people who need assistance or um, can provide assistance, more of like the, the communal aspect of it. So, so I think again, like in, in the macro picture, I think a lot of companies are experiencing a lot of the same things irrespective of the markets. Um, some markets just being the way they are from, again, from a regulatory or consumer behavior perspective, um, just gives different opportunities for those companies to be able to, to move. Great, thank you, Kareem. So um, I, I would say uh, you, you've been talking a lot about the differences and shifts in, in, uh, in markets or shifts in customer behavior, basically towards uh, from traveling as there's a travel ban. So let's channel the energy towards something else. From, from this kind of perspective, I would say there is also a shift in the um, emerging industries that we have been seeing for the past uh, few years and towards what you expect to be uh, rising after post the COVID-19 uh, pandemic issue once it's controlled for so long. So basically, uh, from, from this scope, from your side, what do you see the global shift is going to look like? And follow, following on that, I would, I would like to see how Fadi would think um, the, the, that's, that kind of, uh, Yanni, I would care to know Fedi's comments on the MENA and if Egypt is going to follow the same path as these industries or not. Sure. Um, so I think some of the obvious ones, like I mentioned, is uh, telemedicine, right? Telehealth, I think, is going to be, uh, it's going to be one of the big winners emerging from this. Um, the second thing which everybody's seeing right now that we're actually experiencing is the lack of the necessity to do things in person. Right. And and what is that going to translate to? OK, so teams can work remotely. Um, what does that mean? What does that even mean for a business? What does it mean for a startup? If you don't need to have an office or you can minimize your office, uh, your office usage that allows you to reduce your overhead, that allows you to uh, maybe even reduce salaries because employees don't need to travel and there's a significant component of their income that they're not going to need to allocate. So I think from just the way people operate uh, in general um, is it's going to have a it's going to have a fundamental shift. Um, and again, you know, this, it, I think it'll change the way that that startup companies specifically because they're used to being agile. They're used to being very, very lean. Um, I think the way they operate is, is, is going to be very, very different. So, Fedi, yeah. from from your perspective, uh, mm. do you think the shifts are going to be the same? Is it mainly uh, healthcare based, or do you see other yeah. sectors as well rising in Egypt? Yeah, I, I see another sector, but also I see uh, the, comparing the com the countries uh, uh, Egypt again uh, the, the the golden dragon for our region. We have a bit of an issue on the infrastructure, and this has been apparent because of all that. And I mean infrastructure in terms of the internet capacity and whatever supports uh, the digital uh, transformation. So we need to work a bit on that. So in UAE, for example, they're a bit more advanced, so things run more smoothly. The government works very normally there. We, we are more in trouble than this. So we have this a bit on the lower uh, side of things, which is different than the US. But on the verticals and on the businesses, of course, health, uh, um, the health vertical is very important. And another one that I've seen and I've witnessed when I go back home or the days I work from home is the education. So we, we, we weren't ready for the online education in Egypt. And maybe in, in the other countries of the region, they were. We lack a bit on, uh, again, the infrastructure of the schools and of the universities to have the online education is something good. So there is an opportunity there. Uh, and of course, uh, on the, and the third vertical that I've seen is the, uh, what relates to the companies and the productivity, the online productivity. And for that, companies were a bit reluctant in Egypt and I've, I've led this in our companies to have a work from home policy. And there was a lot of always debate. If we do this, then we lose the, the, the employee, they can't work from home, and we're, and we're there. And companies have started to adapt the pro different productivity ways. We've talked to our friends in Europe to see how they can manage, I mean, the non-quantifiable uh, 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 
uh, departments, how they can manage and how can they quantify their, their, their work, like the supporting function, I mean, versus like the development with the hours and so on. So we've looked at different solutions and we've tested and, 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 and found some interesting uh, 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 direction there. So what I would say the health, definitely the education and the, the productivity uh, in general. And as I told you, the, different, uh, the differences between the countries. Perfect. So, um, we, so th there are two things that are kind of uh, in play now that I want to take uh, your perspectives on. So basically, from one side, um, there is uh, always this, um, this kind of concern that how many uh, people of the Egyptian population are actually working from home and how many people of the Egyptian population are actually uh, online now doing work versus how many uh, else are not and how many else are still in the streets and how many else are still working on other things and we have yeah. also been noticing a big rise in e-commerce and uh, yeah. payment gateways and fintech specifically yeah. in 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 this area of the region not so sure. pretty much we know we know for a fact that the whole mena and i know karim has uh, from crunchbase basically also have a couple of investments in the mena as well so maybe you could also add the, some perspective on that and we have also yeah. seen that the whole mena is unbanked and uh, with the banks being closed we don't have that kind of opportunity in in a lot of countries i mean not egypt but in a lot of other countries we don't have a lot of opportunities where um, the unbanked people can uh, access these kind of services currently with the, with the coming challenges. So how do you see this yeah. pattern going on? I, I, I want to add it. Maybe I, I didn't mention, uh, the, of course, the e-commerce and the fintech, but to answer your question about how many people in the street and online and so on, I've, I've seen a very interesting report from Apple. They've been tracking the people in different countries to see uh, the normal trend before Corona and after Corona. And we've seen in Cairo, I, I got the Cairo versus uh, like Germany. So in Cairo, the traffic of uh, of people in the streets and the cars and so on went down to 50% compared to Europe to 90%. So this tells you a bit on why the lockdown is really not a lockdown in Egypt. Um, so that's the first part. The second part, of course, maybe I had forgot to mention this, uh, but definitely for the e-commerce, uh, you know, we invested in a new e-commerce for fashion. And as you know, fashion is not a necessity. And because of the retail closure, We've been uh, bombarded with the different uh, brands that want to go online quickly. We're, the companies plan to go live in June, but everyone is now finding ways to go right now to get any money uh, because again, like 80% of the shops and the malls and so on and the weekends, they don't work and so on. So, uh, so th this one uh, definitely, and we, we've invested a lot in the ecosystem in companies within the ecosystem of e-commerce. So we've seen, either a growth or uh, uh, at least not a decline for these companies, whether these companies handle payment or handle uh, uh, delivery or handle uh, actual e-commerce. So we've seen based on the necessities or non-necessities of these products, uh, uh, an increase or a decline on that. But on the overall, we've seen a bit of growth and the health tech as well. I forgot to mention one of the investments we have there, we've seen uh, a 35 percent growth uh, in March versus the other uh, the previous months so um, so that, that 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 to add to the question of uh, the verticals and uh, where people are perfect thank you Karim do you agree with the, with the, with these kind of patterns do you think e-commerce is going to be picking up um, or continuing to pick up even after the covid 19 or are we going to go back to our old habits of actually going physically to buy our products and so on I mean, I definitely think that uh, a percentage will go back, but I think there's going to be, like I said, um, with the example from work from home, I think there's going to be a notable percentage that will be more uh, e-commerce e e focused, right? And and to kind of uh, add to what Fedi was saying, there's also like secondary things aside from the core e-commerce itself, like being able to provide uh, products um, digitally. Um, it's actually like the secondary components, right? So what does, you know, how do you actually create an immersive experience? For example, one of the companies uh, we've been looking at was an, a company that's able to leverage augmented reality to be able to take physical products and literally spin them around, right? To be able to see what they would really look like, you know, um, to really get that up close and personal feeling. And I think there will be a much bigger drive because augmented reality 
uh, and, and virtual reality, I think as part of the e-commerce experience is going to play a very, very big role, right? As a kind of a secondary supportive, uh, supportive function. Um, regarding, oh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, so I wanted to take uh, to take an additional point to that, basically, where um, because of the uh, challenges that the, the global supply chain is facing currently and the, the limited uh, travel uh, and limited uh, shipping, basically, that everyone is facing, um, there is a question regarding the culture and arts industry. Do you think uh, there is a good chance that uh, arts and culture, this is a good time for arts and culture to pick up, or is this a bad time to start investing into something new? In, in that kind of sense? Uh, it's a really good question. So basically local products, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a really good question. Fedi, do you want to start with, with some ideas on that? Uh, no, but uh, I, I stumbled across the Google Museums and I thought it was an amazing way to have the kids enjoying something cultural at home instead of the PlayStation and the gaming and all that. So. Uh, but you know, I haven't really looked at the culture part and the art part of it, which is quite interesting, you know, to have exposure on it while you're, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> locked. Yeah. yeah. So fr from culture, I also meant uh, so local local products, basically, uh, not just culture and arts in terms of oh, activities okay. and so on. So uh, yeah, I just wanted to. I uh, I thought I wasn't clear. I'm sorry. I think so definitely... is local products going to pick up. Basically. Yeah, I think, I think definitely there's going to be a more inward focused, uh, an inward focused uh, um, uh, product and, and supply shift, right? I mean, we were already seeing kind of even pre-COVID, we were seeing a very, a lot of very protectionist measures kind of coming into play in the global market, right? Um, the U.S. and China, for example, um, and and being able to focus more about production uh, at home. You know, the other thing too is if you think about the supply chain issue, right? Businesses are meant to run on a very, very extremely efficient right and that doesn't allow for volatility in the supply chain supply chain management so the more the more the closer that all of your resources are or your products or your inputs are the more you'll be able to control for volatility and be able to manage for that so i think that's definitely something even from the supply chain perspective that companies are going to be looking at right if if my production comes from overseas and it takes three weeks and I can turn that around to, to seven days locally, right? And I have, and I can manage capacity and more volatility and capacity, that may be a safer bet because again, with the supply chain and supply chain logistics and the lack, uh, the lack of being able to kind of like increase and decrease based off of volatility, I think that's going to have a significant effect. I agree hundred percent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so also from the agri, agri tech sector or agricultural sector, basically, it has, we have not seen a lot of uh, activities uh, in Egypt specifically. We have, we have seen some activities coming or some interesting startups coming out of uh, Lebanon and so on. Um, but still, we have not seen anything significant in terms of a growing company that has raised uh, a decent amount to grow sustainably enough. But uh, there may be a shift now to locally produced uh, products and with especially with the uh, prices and the uh, demand tightening in terms of these kind of perspectives. So is this something that you may be looking at in terms of financing in the coming times as well, in terms of as, as an essential business? Yeah, you know, very interestingly um, for us back in, in 2017, um, Google Ventures invested in a, uh, a concept that was essentially, it was farm to table, but it was more like mass production. And it was really interesting, the story that the partner at Google Ventures, um, that he explained is that he got something from, it was essentially a local, uh, local greenhouse that created everything organically. And it was delivered to him um, literally within hours from being taken off the vine, a tomato off the vine. And he put it in his, he put it in his house and he traveled for a week and he came back and it was still fresh, right? Because you removed essentially a lot of the supply and a lot of the, uh, uh, a lot of the time that would be wasted in, in transit. So um, this was something that was very, very interesting. I think even now more than ever, it's going to be something that may be a, a much bigger focus. We already know that there was kind of a, a, a pretty notable movement uh, in the market going towards more organic, more local uh, type of initiatives anyway. And I think that this is, uh, this is definitely going to just accelerate that. So, and um, I would like to take the conversation a little bit towards um, from, from the emerging industries that we expect uh, to be taking place to where the startups are actually now. 
So a lot of the startups that are actually working now, um, if they were in a shift from uh, a nice to have product towards a necessity, if they were in the rising kind of uh, industries, they still face a bit of cash shortages and uh, cash flow problems, maybe uh, cost structure problems. However, they still do have uh, the interesting opportunity that is still in the market. So do you expect that there will be some mechanism to help uh, to help overcome those uh, governmental and maybe also from uh, investors? Would investors be willing to look at this kind of uh, opportunity uh, as something to make money out of and uh, help the startups that are working in the market? Yeah, I mean, from a governmental part, we've seen this uh, in Europe and uh, Many of the companies that are affected by Corona and uh, whether they're small, medium, uh, I'm not sure about the startups, but uh, they could file the companies, uh, they could file to the government and the government covers up to 70%. I'm talking about the OPEX cost, I'm talking about the, the, the cost of the employees, the, the salaries and so on. So they can file and the, the government would cover, I'm not sure about the US, but in Europe, this, hap this is happening in uh, Germany and the UK where a government is covering up to 70, from 60 to 70% of the cost of the employees, at least. Mm -hmm. uh, from an investment perspective, definitely. I mean, if uh, we're, uh, and, and this we're doing on the E15 level for both the big companies and the small companies, what, what uh, we're looking at is first, we understand that, and we make it very clear to the companies, we're not expecting, especially with the companies that generate big profits, we're not expecting to make any profit this year. Our main concern and focus would be on the employees. We don't want any employee to leave and we make sure about that. So, and what we're doing is trying to find, uh, to create like a, a reserve fund or a, a, call it a, an emergency fund uh, out of the cash that is already uh, produced and has been produced by the companies to make sure that we're sustaining the companies until this goes, uh, until this pass. And with the opportunities that are happening with some of the, uh, for some of the startups, uh, we're ready definitely, I mean, for our uh, portfolio companies to continue or to, uh, to do mezzanine or uh, follow-up investment to make sure that they are grabbing the opportunity without closing. So we're doing that. And for other startups that, are, that, that find a way to pivot uh, to a model that would be successful to overcome this and be ready for the coming phase, then definitely yes. Uh, that's from our perspective as A50. Sure, and from Karim, do you think um, the investment uh, and basically the acceleration, all of the entrepreneurship support uh, kind of mechanisms, uh, financing mechanism, do you think, uh, do you also think they would continue to perform just shifting a bit on industries and so on? Or do you think it's going to be a little bit of a hold on until we figure out what's happening? No, I think they'll continue to perform. I mean, you know, you, you have you have other opportunities, right? Um, you have the ability, for example, to um, to consolidate companies, to be able to make a purchase that might enhance the value added of a of a, of a portfolio company that you have, whether it's to gain uh, functionality, market share, uh, et cetera, right? So I think that's that's one angle and one one way um, that that things could be. Um, aside from that, you obviously have um, different opportunities, right? Like you, this this is creating a ecosystem or circumstances where you find other opportunities that weren't that weren't previously there. So I think there there is a balance. Um, you know, I think knee jerk reaction, everybody just pauses, you know, uh, for a minute uh, and kind of like uh, everyone pauses and kind of. Um, takes a step back. Um, and I think we're, I think that that's kind of happened uh, already and people are now beginning to, you know, beginning to get beyond the, the point of triage. Um, uh, like uh, Fibby was saying, we were, we, one of the things that we were doing was also working with the companies, helping them triage, um, trying to see how they can reduce expenses, focusing on the health and wellness of, uh, of the employees, right? And then putting together contingency plans and helping them essentially work giving them that support. Um, so overall, I still think that there's going to be uh, other opportunities. It may take, you know, it may have taken two steps back, but it's already beginning to take another step forward. Um, and we'll see, I think it might even create more opportunities than, than previously, because with a massive, any type of massive volatility or disruption like this, you, you, you're literally opening up huge gaps for, for additional opportunities. And I think that there will be a vacuum going into those gaps. 
perfect. And yes. so for both of you as, as investors, since you both agree that you're actually going to continue investing and this is this is creating uh, a whole new level of opportunities. So it would be unwise to just hold on on it and, and say, no, I'm going to just wait for it to clear out. Uh, from from that kind of perspective, uh, we have been reading a lot of articles and you know, we've been seeing a lot of people um, kind of uh, giving us some, some insights on, you know what, investors wouldn't be willing to invest in, in top line uh, activities now or uh, expenditures basically, and ex in return of uh, bottom line basically expenditures. And what I mean by top line for the entrepreneurs is basically, um, if, is a, if a company comes to your financial institution and they are pitching um, an opportunity to invest in customer acquisition, new customer acquisition basically rather than in holding back talents and making sure that they can deliver the value itself and and they make and making sure that they can sustain uh, the situation itself how would you like to comment on that would, would that be something that you would be willing to do or would you shy away from top line activities uh, um i'll start um i wouldn't shy away from top line activities if they had a very thorough plan, right? Like, okay, you're going to focus on customer acquisition. Uh, tell me what the next phase is like, right? Show me the number, show me, show me the, the statistically relevant data, right? If you're talking about using this opportunity because customer acquisition costs are like almost non-existent now, right? Like they're, it's extremely low. So it may be a good idea where if you're paying $50 to acquire a customer, now you're paying a dollar or $2. It may make sense for you to leverage this time to be able to get that top line growth, right? But you have to also tell me what, how do you forecast the, the next phase? Okay. After the acquisition, then frequency in the product and how do you convert that into actual uh, reoccurring revenue or baskets or, 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 or bottom line. Right. Um, so I still think there's plenty of opportunities. Again, there's always a silver lining, but it is very uh, contextual. It's on a case by case basis. Yeah. I agree with Karim and I want to add that because we have a, uh, uh, one of the products, I mean, within one of the companies, we've seen the cost of acquisition really going, uh, I mean, going low comparatively because people are online. This is a company that is offering in online entertainment. So the cost of acquisition went down. Uh, however, the lifetime value of the customer has is shortened. But what we've seen and add, adding to Karim, as long as the unit economics will eventually make sense and there is a plan that this would become a sustainable and profitable uh, and not only growing on the top line, then definitely yes. But just to add, Hamza and I, I, we didn't say that we're investing in the moment. We're cautiously optimistic. We're putting the reserve fund for our companies uh, to make sure that we cover them in case of the corona delay to quarter three, quarter four, and so on. So we're not really investing outside, but of course we're scouting. And, and we've seen some very interesting uh, products and companies uh, on different sectors. However, it's a bit risky because as, as I explained before the call, I mean, our funds comes from the profitability and from the cash, uh, from uh, dividends distribution of our own company. So if I'm not uh, covering my uh, portfolio first, then I'm at risk to invest in a in, in, in newer company unless there's a really, really good opportunity. But again, that's, we're cautiously optimistic on that. Thank you for that clarification, actually. And so I would say, um, fr from that kind of perspective, you are looking at already existing portfolio companies that are already performing in the market, and a lot of other companies are pretty close to that. Uh, not for you specifically to invest in, but I mean, um, you're pretty much not going to be able to give money for all of your portfolio. So what would you say would be the right uh, management solutions or the right uh, actions that your startups are taking that you would advise other startups to also take? Like what would be the right approach to basically stabilize things until you seek investment or other things? Well, so there are two strategies in general and we've talked, uh, I mentioned, but I'll give you more details about, I mean, you're either on the offense, so you're pushing, you're doing some marketing, you're acquiring a customer, you're doing promotion on your products, or on, you're on the defense, you're quite, uh, you know, uh, sustaining uh, uh, your losses, you're, you're not, you're uh, taking care of your cost, you're, you're you know, uh, not, uh, so the, within these two strategies, what we've seen, because most of our startups, and I say most, are within the ecosystem that is, uh, within the e-commerce e uh, ecosystem and for that we've seen that actually promoting and working on the offense for these startups is generating very good leads 
and is doing quite good traffic, whether on the productivity uh, product and, and startup that we have, whether on the other uh, e-commerce related businesses. So being on the offense in these companies is paying off. On the bigger companies that are less, uh, uh, more difficult to uh, pivot and less nimble and less uh, agile, these companies are all on the defense uh, because they need to make sure that they can pay the huge cost that they have so they, are, they cannot afford to go and really push for uh, promoting or pushing new products and so on. So they are more on the defense. And, and any, any company or startup, I mean, depending on what they're offering, which country they are, they would choose between these two strategies. Um, yeah, that, that, that would be my, my, my advice on, on that. Um, Hamid, I think you're on, uh, you're on mute. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> forgot to be on mute. So basically, um, I've been looking a little bit on the uh, investment climate internationally as well. And my question is a little bit to Karim, but, but also Fadi, if you have in, any insights on MENA, I would appreciate it a lot. Um, we have seen a lot of uh, a lot of regions who have access to data uh, that have showed increased decline in number of transactions or basically number of investments uh, that are going on. Um, in Egypt, we have we've been seeing. You know, I can't I can't really say there's a decline, but I, I I'm more inclined to say there's a pause uh, of these kind of transactions currently. Um, a lot of countries based on data are trying to project uh, when would be uh, the return of the investment to, to the hard time. Would you say this is more of a recalibration or do you think that a lot of investors would, wouldn't, wouldn't be interested to continue investing in the market? So a lot of investment would, would suffice with what they have already and wouldn't want to do follow on investments. So basically my, my question is, um, when do you expect uh, the regular kind of transaction volume to return? Is it quarter three? Is it next year? Is it, what are your take on it? Very, very, hard, very hard to kind of pin a timeline to it, um, but I can give some inputs onto, I think, what, what may help define that, right? Um, it's all about investor confidence, right? Um, and also investor appetite. Um, you know, I think that the initial numbers that we're seeing, like I mentioned before, is is the knee jerk reaction, right? It's the it's the initial shock, um, and, and and whenever that happens, everybody likes to just take a very very slow pace to kind of begin seeing on un, uh, things unfold. But you have to remember, you know, for the group of investors that are that are less risk averse, right? There's a fine time for them to be able to jump in. They want to be able to jump in at an early time to be able to capture that opportunity, right? Um, and then some who are a little less averse, you know, they, they may wait a little bit longer. So I think if you were to try to quantify that, you know, look at the number, you know, think about the number of aggressive versus non-aggressive investors and be able to see, and I think you'll be able to create kind of some correlation between there. Now, is there data available or is there an index available based off that? I'm not really sure, but, um, but I think that'll help kind of, uh, I think that'll help kind of create a, a little bit better of an understanding. Um, but yeah, I mean, you also just have to remember that investors are opportunistic by nature, right? Uh, as well, um, so you know, inherently, they're, they 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 money that's sitting around, you know, is is not it's not doing it's not working for them, right? Um, so they want to be able to put it to work. Um, so them putting it to work really again depends on their appetite and um, and and their uh, their profile. Yeah, I have so nothing to add except to, yeah. Yes, Sorry, please. no, no. Please okay, so I, I just wanted to follow up on that, uh, uh, and my question is actually to, to Fadi. Basically, um, you can you can just continue on. Uh, basically, um, where do you see uh, the inter-country uh, transactions that were previously uh, dealt on taking place? Like, how is this going to continue? Are startups going to still have access to international uh, investment funds and investment uh, opportunities, or is it going to be a little bit more localized until things? get by and and regular travel is, is back on speed <laughs> i mean from yeah, uh, even from your perspective i don't yeah. i don't mean like the global thing i'm just asking no no it's but again uh, as karim said i mean the opportunistic the, there are always opportunistic investors and ready i mean and this is a really right time you know, for to acquire like failing companies or failing startups at, at very low prices. So, no, I would say that there are definitely, I don't think that this would, 
I, I think no, that the uh, appetite for investors would continue. I mean, in this region, and, and this wouldn't change. And that, how long uh, it will take for them to come back, or how long? I mean, the, the countries would open. I mean, some some expectations are are end of year, and the, the real worry is not to die from the corona, is to die because of the economy uh, economy exactly. issues. So I like the word. I don't like the word opportunistic. I like it in the sense that you can be opportunistic by offering something that would help or invest in a company that would help actually the community or economy and so on. But yeah, I mean, everything is opportunistic if, uh, I mean, uh, yes. You know, so yeah. I, I hope I answered you. I'm, I'm not <laughs> yes, 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 sure, sure. Uh, so it's basically all, all back to opportunity. So even if you find a company that is elsewhere, not in Egypt mainly, and they have a decent opportunity in the market and you think you can capitalize on that opportunity, you would you'd definitely be interested to, to go in. Uh, so my, my other part of the question is, um, we, as we see a shrink in, in uh, the, the number of transactions, at least for a while, um, we, we expect also that angel investors are going to be even more risk averse. Um, they do not have the same mechanisms as, as um, venture capital firms. And they have a little bit of uh, these states. Do you agree with this kind of statement or do you think uh, angel investors are going to be continuing and if not to see more of these going into that space see see it kind of ticket size i think i was cutting off i yeah. can see from your yeah faces. you, you yeah, cut sorry <laughs> is it better now is it better now yeah, yeah now it's better I will, I will, and we okay. heard something about angel investors and if they would yes. stop or continue or yeah Yes, so basically to be short, uh, we expect or there's a lot of expectations that angel investment is going to shrink in the coming phases. Uh, angel investors are, are pretty much a, a little bit more risk averse. Um, will uh, VCs with the mechanisms established be willing to step into this kind of risk uh, stage or risk ticket size, the, the seed, pre-seed kind of stage? Or are they still going to hold on their uh, grounds and hope for the startups who have already made it to th their stage to continue their investments? You know, I think that's tough because, you know, institutional VCs or the bigger VCs, they have a mandate, right? And their mandate is a specific ticket size. You know, there's a risk profile that they do. And if they, they have a little bit of flexibility, but, you know, they're, they're somewhat limited to going outside of that risk profile. So if you're talking about like a, um, uh, series A and later uh, institution, it's going to be very hard for them to kind of fill in, in the, the, the angel on the angel side of things. One thing that I think I, you know, you can make a fairly safe assumption that, you know, okay, so angels will reduce their, they are risk averse, right? They will reduce probably um, their investment, but I think maybe what will happen is they'll focus more on industries that they're very that they're very familiar with, right? So if somebody is, I'm an angel investor and I'm a doctor and I get the med space, so I'm going to invest in med tech. Maybe I won't dabble outside of that, right? Um, which is, I think, I think maybe more of the movement that you'll be able to see. But overall, I do agree. I do think it, it will be uh, there will be less capital at that at that stage. Yeah, I would say definitely uh, I agree with Karim and especially with the institutional uh, VCs uh, and on the higher, uh, on the bigger tickets, uh, Series A and so on, they have the mandate, they, they won't be able to go down. So maybe this, I would say the seed VCs, some of them would maybe fill in a bit on the angel part. But again, even the angel investments, I would see the angel investors, that they would, some of them based on the vertical and what they uh, you know, have expertise in and where they see the opportunity in, they could maybe even fund more at, at the right time. But yeah, but in, in uh, yeah, overall, I agree with Karim. So I just wanted to remind uh, everybody on the webinar that we are 15 minutes um, to go and we are taking questions from the questions you're already posting. So if you have any questions, please uh, remember to, to post it. I, I'm only repeating this message because some people have uh, came in a little bit late. So uh, I have a question about the offline marketing business and the offline marketing channels, basically. Uh, this was a huge market uh, pre-COVID-19 and, and pre-basically the, the great lockdown. Do you see this market kind of going back to where it is or is it going to, do, do you see this as a, as a main channel where startups are going to go back to look at it or 
do you see it as a, something that is completely shrinking? Shadi, you wanna you wanna take a stab? Uh, yeah, I mean, we're more on the online marketing. Uh, we've seen uh, we've seen more on the performance based uh, marketing going on and less on the branding. Of course, this the effect was uh, there, and uh, of course, less production of uh, offline promotional activities. Let's say that's that that that's. I mean, I'm not sure if if that's the answer, but uh, that's what we've seen from our uh, uh, from our network. Yeah. I also think that one of the things that Fedi and I discussed earlier or mentioned earlier is that um, customer acquisition costs are significantly less right on the digital right now. So if it's cheap and, and it gives you the opportunity to scale and really have a much bigger, uh, much bigger capture, um, it just makes sense. So I think it probably will take some time before that really kicks back into gear. Uh, if it does, and it may not be at, at the same caliber. 100%. Yes, definitely. I think the question was coming from someone who, whose main business is uh, investing in Bill. billboards and so on. Yeah, I think. Billboard? Uh, of, uh, I think. Hello, is there he, was, the question, I mean, uh, there's a nice joke I'm sure most have heard. Uh, who decided on your uh, digital strategy? Is it the CEO or CTO or uh, COVID? So, I mean. <laughs> Going digital is accelerated across all businesses. I mean, that's a very big statement. I mean, that's happening across. Perfect. Perfect. So um, thank you all for joining us. I think uh, we're good in questions. So it has been a great pleasure having you all. Um, so we're getting some questions more. Maybe maybe let's just take the, the last two questions. Uh, I don't so, Okay, so basically, uh, this is a very interesting question. Uh, what would you say to the startups who started just before COVID-19 developing yeah. the products and have not launched yet, but they had the product? I just had a talk, but I'm having a talk with one of the startups that I'm, I'm, I mean, I was discussing, but he, it's exactly the same scenario. He got the money, uh, made the product, but the product was based on a bit of offline activities that are not happening. So I would understand from him his way to how he will pivot on that. So, yeah, but those who, who got the money and, and made the product, then it depends what kind of product this is. Is it a product that would uh, be successful now that would generate any traction now, or it's better maybe to pivot, to develop the product more and wait for the post Corona and then launch it. And at the meantime, understand the market better, the dynamics and so on. So it depends really on what, what, what kind of product it is. Yeah. 100%. There's also something that I think not a lot of people, not a lot of people really consider is if you take investment and you set out to, to introduce a product or service and something happens in the market, or maybe you even have some, you're trying to validate very early and you don't get that validation. Um, I know it's probably, I know people may be shocked to think, but you can always return the money to the investors, right? Like you can always let them know, Hey, we don't have a high level of confidence anymore. You don't, you don't have to burn the money, you know, keep the relationship, you know, take some time, you know, try to see what maybe the next thing might be. And, and it's a very honorable and a very respectable thing to do. You know, um, I've seen a couple of entrepreneurs do it um, and they've moved on in their second, third, fourth ventures to be extremely, extremely successful. Um, so uh, not a recommendation, but just something to keep in mind. You know? Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I hope to see that too. I highly doubt it. Oh, that's a sure. So um, there's also the, the last question is uh, is coming on the uh, real estate part or the construction part mainly. Uh, this business has been going on in in the traditional side for basically years and years. Do you see uh, the current situation uh, giving way to to kind of disrupt this kind of market? I, I do in a couple of different ways. I mean, I, I don't want to say so. So think about a blend between like fintech and construction, for example. So think about like Egypt. There's a significant amount of remittances. I mean, you know, what is it, 24 to 26 billion in remittances inbound into Egypt? Think about if you can create a platform for people who are in the diaspora that are financing apartments. That happens a lot, right? Creating a platform that is actually a secondary market that allows for 
microfinancing, for example, or, or payment plans that you can partner with developers, right, where technology can facilitate that um, in the real estate sector. So I think there's room for innovation like that. You know, you just have to kind of look at the entire value chain, look at the traditional frameworks, and then from there be able to see what are some innovative ways to be able to be able to help and support it. Um, as far as the core construction, like actually cement and stuff like that, it's not really, uh, not really my game, so I can't really speak to it. Perfect. So do you have any other uh, reflections on this? No. Okay, perfect. Perfect. So um, again, as we were wrapping up, uh, thank you all uh, for attending. I think um, I would love to leave uh, the, the final words uh, for our panelists, a couple of minutes, maybe share some advice to uh, our entrepreneurs, maybe our uh, the startups, investors, the angel investors that are listening. Uh, I just wanted to recap on uh, the highlights of what would been said. Uh, basically, the, the most interesting or promising uh, sectors to, that, that you see coming is, uh, and it, please correct me if I'm wrong, is basically edtech, uh, healthcare, and telemedicine, basically. Um, so agribusiness is also pretty interesting. Uh, local production, uh, local production is going to pick up supply chain um, as we got it. And so those are the most interesting areas. Um, if you would like to comment on that or basically give some final tips or final advices for our uh, startups and thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank I you. Want to add, I just want to add a couple of things. One is um, um, the e-commerce, I think that, um, that we had mentioned kind of a, a little bit later. And think about marketing tech too. Think about mar marketing technology. Um, right now, traditional, traditional market, a lot of people are spending time on OTT platforms, right? Uh, like Netflix, uh, uh, Hulu, uh, HBO, et cetera. Think about the back end type of marketing and data management uh, for consumers uh, on that. I think it might be another industry that's uh, really attractive right now. Yeah. Yes, perfect. Thank you, Karim. Yeah. No, I don't have anything else to add. I mean, I've talked about all the verticals, just that uh, really, I mean, this time and from the bottom of my heart, it's all about staying positive, being uh, optimistic, growing yourself. I think it's a great time to work on yourself. And it's a marathon. Again, I mean, life and uh, the startup scene and, and I mean, as an entrepreneur or a, a business leader and so on, this is not the end. It's just a delay. And it's, again, it's, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. So everyone and everyone has his, his own race. So don't panic, please. Stay positive and stay safe. I hope I'm staying safe. 100%. Right. And focus, focus on your team, focus on your people. Um, you know, that's really what matters. That's what, that's what, what a company is, right? So people working together towards the same goal. So, um, um, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Very wise words to close by. Uh, it was an honor. It was a great discussion. Thank you so much for uh, giving us the time and giving it to our people. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you, Hamza. Thank you, Kareem. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Okay.